All right, settle down at the back. Is everyone here? Do we have a quorum of fights gone by listeners? Might as well start then. Punching my time card, we're going to talk about a Michelle Waterston main event. Um, <laughs> fucking hell. Um, I'm your boy Jack Slack. It's the Fights Gone By podcast. Coming at you on a week full of fights. None of them particularly interesting. So you know the deal on a week with weird fights. We're going to talk about news. We're going to ramble a bit. And we're just going to have a good time. I'm probably going to end up talking about Andy Hug and Chris Eubank, <laughs> to be honest, because that's what I've been watching this week. Um, but in terms of news, the UFC rebooked Magomed Ankalaev versus Ion Kutalaba for UFC 254 on October 24th. Now, if you recall, Ion Kutalaba got COVID, tested positive for COVID, uh, went away. They came back after the required amount of time for him to recover from COVID, and he tested positive again. And the story was that he actually got reinfected from uh, trying to suck his own dick. Now, I'm not a doctor, but that does sound believable. Do you remember when Magomed Ankalaev was a super prospect? Like, this guy's more promising than Cam, uh, Kamzat is. Uh, and then he came in, beat the shit out of Paul Craig, lost two seconds of the fight at the very end, in a, falling into a submission, a triangle choke. And um, then he's beaten everyone since then, and now he's lost a whole year of his life trying to beat Ion Kutalaba twice. Because <laughs> Ion Kutalaba lost the first one, complained, got a rematch... And now just keeps dropping out. This dude is stealing... Like, this is exactly how I expect Ion Kutalaba to handle a loss. At least steal a year of the guy's career. And be a really sore loser about it. What else is going on? I mean, there's continued talk about Dustin Poirier versus Tony Ferguson. I don't think we talked about that before on the podcast. But it's been rumbling for a while. I don't know if they've formally signed anything. But it does keep coming up. Stipe Miocic signed with a new talent agency. Um... We got a new Ultimate Fighter coming up, which I forgot that the Ultimate Fighter was a thing because this is the only time that it's not been on in like the last two decades. But Calvin Cater was throwing himself into the mix. He said he'd coach opposite Max Holloway. Max Holloway, a proven UFC star, I think he'd do well. Don't know if you need Cater on there. I suppose that would be an okay way to justify another Volkanovski versus Holloway fight, even though he'd lost the previous two on the scorecards at least. Um, because that's what they did with Ken Shamrock and Tito Ortiz, isn't it? They just had them host uh, the Ultimate Fighter until they could do the third loss. Sombre news, uh, my boy Ricardo Lamas has retired, which is a real shame because he was, you know, you saw him in his last fight, he was great there. Uh, Always been a a top 15 sort of guy, uh, featherweight, been around forever. I mean, never really broke through to the... uh, He he did get a title shot at one point against Jose Aldo, and that was... You know, Aldo at his um, zenith, probably. You know, it, it just untouchable. You know, you've got a guy in you know, Alamas who's a very strong wrestler, uh, very strong grappler, generally, and uh, obviously couldn't take Aldo down for the life of him. Aldo, that was a really... Those were the sort of performances that turned a lot of people off Aldo. You know, he was never a huge star for the UFC, uh, and part of it was that it always looked like he could just dominate the guy at any second but he'd sort of hang back and be like look how well I'm doing and then put on a burst of activity towards the end of a round like it's especially in that Ricardo Lamas one because there is a moment where he just decides to throw Lamas to the mat and mount him immediately when he'd been doing very little up to that point but always been one of the guys that I well I, I had a love-hate relationship with Ricardo Lamas because I didn't like him originally but then the more I watched him the more I realized he's actually more interesting when he's on the back foot when he or well, when he's on his back actually played an amazing guard Go watch the Filthy Casuals guide to it. It's the most recent one I uploaded. It's a re-upload, but yeah, wonderful guard game. Um, real shame that he, you know, he goes out now on a win, which is great, but on a win over someone who wasn't a name, you know, it was a last minute replacement. And um, that Ryan Hall fight would have been a great one to go out on a win with because Ryan Hall was so dangerous and respected up to that point. And it would have been a great one for Ryan Hall to get because that would have been you know, the last you're going to get out of Ricardo Lamas' ranking and name value. But, um, and of course, you know, the matchup itself was super interesting. But, you know, real shame. Um, So, yeah, sadly that's off. Uh, They signed Charles Oliveira versus Benil Darius. We talked about that. Charles Oliveira is apparently out of it. No idea why. Hopefully they took RDA out of that fight with Makachev and they're making Oliveira Makachev, but they're probably not. Um, So you've got Benil Darius without an opponent. And there's rumblings, not just among me, but with other people too, of a Diego Ferreira fight for Darius, which sounds banging. I mean, they did fight years ago, uh, which I kind of forgot because that was like big Afro uh, Diego Ferreira. 
And he has changed so much in like the last two years, three years. You know, I keep forgetting that basically a year has passed while I've been locked in quarantine. And then the big news is that Betch Kohea has re-signed to the UFC for one night only. And she's fighting some Korean lass I've never heard of. But I'm saying one more title run. That's what I want. Because the UFC cut her. And then they clearly realised, oh, we need her. We need Betch Kohea. But apparently this is going to be her, uh, her retirement fight. So good for her. She did far better than she should have. There was actually a point when I was excited for Betch Kohea. Um, embarrassingly. Uh, I can't remember who it was. She was throwing like body shots against someone. And I remember being like, that's great. Do more of that, bitch. And then I realised that she just didn't have anything more. It was one of those things where you're like, this person's improving all right. And then you go, oh no, that's actually their ceiling. Just looking down the Reddit news thread. So many fucking COVID tests positive. Like, well, I, you know, that's America and the UK at the moment. Just everyone's got fucking COVID. They just announced today that no more than six people can gather socially unless you're at a restaurant or a bar or wherever. Basically, if there's a card reader within reasonable distance, you're allowed to hang out together. Oh, and then they're doing Jermaine Durandamy versus Juliana Pena for least liked woman in the UFC. But that's about your lot for the for the news. Or rather, that's my stalling out of the way. Time to talk about Michelle Waterson. Now, if you're not in on the meme, Michelle Waterson, I mean, have you ever watched her fights? She just throws kicks at air. Um, someone put up an amazing compilation of her using missed kicks to the face to land head kicks as Joanna and Jacek ca came in. Um, the the thing is, like, faking kick, fainting and fake kick, fainting, fuck, fainting and faking, or feigning and fake, whatever. A faint is like, you show part of the motion. A fake is like when you actually do the technique, but with no intention of landing. Uh, fakes like that generally less useful than feints. Feints are wonderful for getting people moving, getting drawing out a reaction, then and then moving into your follow up to get someone out of position and capitalize. Um, you know, a fake does the same sort of thing, but they're the more you know it's. There are less circumstances when they're as useful as feints because you're not opening yourself up as much when you're fainting. Or at least that's how I was taught that they are. I mean, other people use the terms faint and fake uh, interchangeably. And I ain't judging them if they do. But if you want to see someone use feints and fakes effectively in their kicking game, check out someone like John Haggerty, who immediately attacks you with a teep to the chest. And then every other teep after that, or every other knee raise after that, you're thinking, oh, fuck, brace, he's going to he's gonna kick me in the chest, and then he glides in and elbows you in the head or something like that. Obviously very different striking styles, very different fighting styles, but that's an example of how one would kick to feint effectively. To look at someone using the same weapons as uh, Michelle Waterson, but doing it well, you know, like Wonderboy. Draws guys in, uses the defensive sidekick to knock them off balance, then every time he pumps his knee, they think they're going to get kicked in the body and he kicks them in the head. What Michelle Waterston does is throw like three kicks to land one and when the one lands, the person she's hit doesn't even know it landed. Uh, <laughs> that's the Michelle Waterston game. And that's the thing that pisses me off about watching her. And, and it, I think the reason that I've been so pissy about it lately is because it has been really pronounced in her last two fights. She was always a pretty interesting grappler. And if you see her against people like Courtney Casey, um, or anyone actually, you know, she's an atom weight. Really, she's about the smallest woman in the UFC, and she was an atom weight in Invicta, and she basically went up so that she could join the strawweight division when the UFC established it. Now, obviously, the looks and the um, meme kicks and things have always been good selling points. Like in Invicta, she had an amazing fight with Jessica Penne, won the title. They immediately booked her against a 50-year-old Japanese woman. Um, I think she was like 47 or something like that, but it was still embarrassingly old. And that's the only time you'll ever see Michelle Waterson strike aggressively. And she really went after that gun. I think she got the TKO. But then they booked her against, what's her name, Hiberto Tebersier or something like that. But she was a really one-dimensional jiu-jitsu lass. And I was like, oh, another gimme. And then Michelle Waterson actually lost that one. And people were like, oh, Jack, not a gimme at all. And I was like, oh my god, really? No, maybe this Michelle, whatever her name is, Hiberto Tebersio is something. And then she went on to do nothing. She had like two more fights lost, left, never came back. Um... But it's all right because she was already in the UFC by that point. So Michelle Waterson came off the the win over the granny and the loss to the next gimme. And they gave her and Angela Magana, who hadn't won a fight in like four years. But with all that being said, really interesting grappler. Throws up arm bars from everywhere. 
uh, really strong in the clinch, like surprisingly strong. Again, watch her against like Courtney Casey, able to take down much, much bigger people. She got on Journey and Jacek's back in her last fight. But really, in the last couple especially, you have seen us doing stuff at distance and thinking she's doing something when everyone else in the arena is is like, no, you're not you're not accomplishing anything. You know, it's one thing for your opponent to be like, oh, I don't think they hit me that much. I don't think I should have lost the decision. But if everyone else in the arena thinks that you've done nothing and you think you've put on a striking masterclass against Carla Esparza and deserve to win the decision, um, something's wrong there. And I think part of it is um, the distance. You know, she's not actually... Something is making her skittish about actually stepping in. Part of it's not really having very... Ha- you know, not not... Certainly not very confident in her hands. I've seen her land good punches, but she seems to be very reluctant to throw them. Um, and part of it is just placing priority on techniques that don't work. She, the side kick to the knee, she threw that a load against um, Rose Namajunas, and then it's, she missed it, and Rose just slid down the side because she was side on and kicked her in the head. But the side kick to the, to the lead leg is much more useful than, say, the front kick to the face, which she has never, ever landed but throws multiple times per minute almost six feet in front of the opponent. They're like, what are you trying to do? You're not dissuading them from changing levels because they're not going to change levels out there. You're not setting up a kick to the body. You're just throwing your feet at air. Honestly, she should take a page out of the Holly Holm book and start relying on like oblique kicks and things like that. Nice long kicks that you can get off to the opponent's lead leg without putting yourself in much danger of being taken down or knocked over. But she seems to have this real... Like, there is clearly something going on in, in her mind where she feels like throwing lots of kicks at air is doing something. And I think that's where the coach has to step in and say, no, that's not accomplishing anything. Maybe she's gun shy. Who knows? However, she's fighting Angie Hill. And I this is actually a pretty interesting matchup for Waterson because uh, a lot of Angela Hill's problems in the past have come from grappling, people getting a hold of her, grinding on her. Uh, Angie Hill... One of the favourites on the Fighting On By podcast because she's always had quite an interesting striking style. And then she'd fall apart in fights with like, um, well, her first UFC run, you know, she she wasn't very impressive. And then she went back to Invicta, did really well there, four fight winning streak, came back, lost to Jessica Andrade in possibly my favourite women's fight ever. But then had a hit and miss record, started to get it together and has fought a load recently. So she lost to uh, Yan Janan, who we are keeping an eye on because she's, she's pretty bloody good. Um, then she won against Ariana uh, kind of let uh, someone beat Hannah Siffers, who you've seen tons of this year, beat uh, Conlac Sufisara, and then fought Claudia Gadelia, who again, super highly regarded because she was like it was her and Joanna for a little while as, as top dogs. And uh, most people believe that Angela Hill should have got that decision. So I've seen people looking at this and be like, she's got a 0.500 record and uh, just lost to Claudia Gadelia. Why should I care? Uh, and you should care because, like, if you've seen the fights, she's clearly putting some stuff together and improving. And she's, you know, she's been very active. She's She seems to be one of those people who benefits from fighting more. When I say it like that, that sounds stupid. But, you know, like uh, Tyson, they used to put him in with loads of bums because they thought he got a lot out of actually being in there competing as opposed to being in training. There are some guys who used to fight like two times a year, but the six months between, they'll be training like a madman and getting better in the gym. There are other people who seem to to thrive from getting better from actual competition. But yes, this could be a very interesting match because Angela Hill, very uh, when she's left out in the open and, and moving around using her feints, she can be very interesting. But again, that's sort of like what Michelle Waterson likes. She likes to be left alone out of distance and then have those awkward striking contests that aren't really striking contests and then someone ends up winning on the cards. I think on this one, you'd have to hope that Angela Hill's more willing to be aggressive and throw with some heat. You know, Sometimes she ends up trying to play the, the matador as she had to against... Jessica Andrade, and she had to do to a degree against Claudia Gadelia. Um, but I think with Waterson, especially as Waterson is so small, you got to step in and bully. But um, yeah, if you're Waterson, grapple early and often. If you're Angela Hill, try and keep her out of range, but try and crack her as hard as possible whenever you can. And I'm very surprised these guys are actually the same height, because I was going to say, otherwise use, use your height to lean on the double collar side like she did against Jessica Andrade but then Jessica Andrade is listed as like taller than that and she did great work with the double collar side against Jessica Andrade anyway I think that's enough on that fight uh let's have a look the the other thing about this card is that there's a lot of people who I go oh oh, that's interesting but there's just not quite enough to grab onto I mean Frank Camacho versus uh Brock Weavers on the card which was interesting and then Frank Camacho pulled out because he got COVID everyone's getting fucking COVID but Brian Barbarena's back against uh, Anthony Ivey. Don't know a lot about Ivey, but Bar- Barbarena was considered like a, a top 30 guy until very recently. He got he, had, he suffered two bad losses back to back. He had that amazing war with uh, 
Vicente Luke, but that was his second last fight, and that was like eight fights ago for Vicente Luke. So he's been he's not been around for a while, and then he just got knocked out by uh, Randy Brown in the third round of their fight. Honestly, lots of defensive issues with Barbarena, but tough, savvy, good on offense, does some fun hand fighting stuff, and a good grappler to boot, uh, and and really just one of those guys that when you see him on a card, you go, oh well, that'll be fun at least. So Jara Eubanks is on the card. She got a last minute replacement opponent, and then that last minute replacement opponent had to pull out because of the um, because of her weight cut issues. So Sajara Eubanks might be off the card, but then who's watching the card for Sajara Eubanks? Tyson Nam's on against Matt Schnell. Tyson Nam had probably the best showing of his career in his last fight because he fought a dude with four fights who was clearly from the weight class below and just carrying a bit of extra weight. And he smashed him because, you know, it was a guy who really wasn't UFC ready and he just beat the shit out of him. Meanwhile, Matt Schnell is coming in. Uh, he was on a four-fight winning streak and then he fought um, Alexandra Pantoja. And actually got KO'd because Pantoja is normally a bit of a back boy. You know, there's a couple of guys in that flyweight division like him and... Fuck, I can never remember his name. Little Yol Romero. But yeah, a few guys in that division who just like jumping on backs. But yeah, Pantoja knocked him out. But he did submit Lewis, uh, Lewis Smolka. Was that a whole year ago? Fucking hell, but by triangle choke, that was very cool. He actually got two triangle chokes back to back, so Schnell is a fun fighter. Actually, I should have said Schnell versus Smolka was a, a very short but fun grappling fight uh, last time people asked about good grappling fights. Then you got Billy Quarantino, the man of the quarantine, Billy Quarantino against Carl Nelson. Don't really know a lot about Nelson, but I enjoyed Quarantino's last fight. Uh, Ed Herman, who just, you know, he's just tough. Like, if you're going to watch a fight and there's nothing else on, Ed Herman will do. You got Roxanne Modafferi versus Andrea Lee in the co-main. Andrea Lee, good fun from the clinch and okay striking. And Roxanne Modafferi, obviously known for her grappling, but her striking is coming along too. Roxanne Modafferi in the role of just uh, smashing people's faves. So she fought uh, Antonina Shevchenko, who was supposed to lose and beat her. And then she fought Macy Babar when Macy Babar was a uh, hot prospect and she beat her too. But then she loses to people like Jennifer Meyer and Lauren Murphy, who don't have a ton of hype. And then really, like, the most interesting person on this card is Karma Worthy, because he uh, fought Luis Pena, uh, violent Bob Ross, in his last one. And I thought he handled him masterfully. He was circling off, he was landing good uh, rear-handed shots to the body. They were in an open guard matchup. And, um, yeah, he just really handled him well. And then by the th in the third round, uh, he'd hurt him a couple of times, and then he got him the guillotine and finished. Uh, which was remarkable because the UFC had been building Pena as a monster and Wor uh, Worthy had none of it. He's fighting uh, that lad who knocked out Timu Pakalan when Timu Pakalan finally came back from his knee injury. Um, so yeah, fun one there. But I like Worthy. Uh, his last one before he fought Luis Pena, was that Devontae Smith? Yeah, Devontae Smith. The two of them were just striking really, really weirdly. And Kama Worthy had this haircut that was like a... Uh, Feathers McGraw in um, the wrong trousers. <laughs> just, he looks like a, a weird chicken, but he he does he knocks people out and he's entertaining doing it. And I think he's a lot craftier than um, most would expect. You know, looking at his style, you go like, ah, oh, bit of a banger. You know, just awkward. But um, I think he he's a lot more cunning than certainly I gave him credit for after that Devonte Smith fight. But that's just the UFC event. We got Bellator's biggest weekend in a while. Um, and I have problems with my bookie because they won't let me bet on the second card. Uh, they didn't have any of the fights from it up. However, I was able to go all in on Coca on the first card, on 9-11. And I bet on literally every favourite on the card. And then I did a couple of other little parlays where I, I uh, excluded some of the ones I felt most likely to fuck up my parlay. Because any time you look down these cards, you're like, there's a lot of very obvious favourites who should win. And then there's a couple of favourites who you're like, ah, I could see them ruining it for me. Um... Phil Davis versus Leota Machida is the main event, and I rewatched Phil Davis versus Leota Machida, which I always reference because of the banging, intercepting knee Machida hit him with, and then dragged him up off his legs with the underhook. Uh, and then I remembered that that's the only thing that happens in that fight. <laughs> Just fucking nothing else. Um, Leota does nothing. Well, they both do nothing for the first round. Uh, Phil Davis throws like a couple of low kicks, and Machida throws a couple of body kicks, and then he throws a body kick into a left hand, and then flurries on him at the end of the round. Uh, and then the other two rounds are just Machida hitting him, Phil Davis trying to get a takedown, maybe succeeding in the last minute. And they gave the decision to Phil Davis, even though he clearly lost. Not a lot to be invested in in the rematch, to be honest. Every time Phil Davis fights, I'm like, I should be interested in Phil Davis, but I'm not at all. He's not an entertaining fighter. He's a guy with a wrestling background who throws kicks crappily and then will occasionally wrestle. He's a guy who's also benefited enormously from going to a much weaker pool of talent. But Phil Davis is the favourite here because Lyoto's chin is made out of crepe paper nowadays, which is even more embarrassing for Gigard Musassi, who lost that last fight to him. 
Uh, maybe that's a bit harsh. Musashi is a regional guy, um, and Lyoto was, you know, a former world champion, so maybe I'm holding him to too high a standard. We got Ed Ruth going up to middleweight to take on Taylor Johnson. Um, Ed Ruth, the prohibitive favourite there. Katzenganu is coming back from forever off to take on Gabrielle Holloway, who's six and five. Raymond Daniels, who's two and one in MMA, is taking on some four and four guy. Now that's an interesting one because if this guy's any good at MMA, I could see him beating Raymond Daniels. But Raymond Daniels was the huge favourite. Um, Raymond Daniels is a reminder that Scott Coker started a kickboxing promotion just to shut, just to piss off Glory. Basically, he started Bellator kickboxing, spent a load of money acquiring Giorgio Petrosian and Raymond Daniels. And then didn't televise the cards. <laughs> like the, the cards were televised. They'd happen on the same day as the MMA cards. And they'd be televised two weeks after, if at all. And then they quietly stopped doing better talk kickboxing. And Scott was like, uh, you're going to have to fight an MMA, Raymond. So they give him no hope as he does spinning shit and knocks him out. But he is a 40-year-old man trying to learn how to wrestle. Um, or maybe he's not. Maybe he's just here hoping that the guys aren't good enough. They got Rafael Cavallo, who is always hit and miss. He's an extremely hot and cold character. Sometimes you go... Damn, Rafael Cavallo, maybe there are good middleweights out the, outside the UFC. And then he'll just lose really easily to someone he shouldn't. But he's fighting Alex Polizzi. You know, that's a, a 20-fight record versus a six-fight record. Cavallo should be the favourite there, and is. Tyrell Fortune, who they have a lot of, they you know, they put a lot behind him. He's fighting Jack May, who's 11-6. and six. His, lo- his uh, last fight was a loss, but it was against Timothy, uh, Tim Johnson, who obviously fought in the UFC, fought a lot of very good heavyweights. There aren't a lot of he- good heavyweights out there. I mean, obviously, Jack May could catch him, but Jack May does not seem like the sort of dude being put in there to test Tyrell Fortune. He's coming off three losses by finish and then a win by decision. So, yeah, uh, not not expecting him to do well here. Oh, well, Jack May was in the UFC. He just got knocked out by Derek Lewis and Sean Jordan but, and uh, back to back and then Chase Sherman as well. Man, you really can you can get anywhere if you're a heavyweight. There's a couple of others I don't care about, like Leslie Smith versus Amanda Bell. Um, Leslie Smith is the favourite because she has all that UFC experience, but I could see her losing that very easily. And Keith Lee versus Vinicius Zaney. Um, yeah, whatevs. I don't know anything about Keith Lee, but he was the favourite. Um, or maybe he wasn't. Anyway, I bet on all the favourites, and then I took out the ones that I wasn't very certain of and made another bet. Uh, I think I bet like £2 on each. Very unlikely to get the full return. But that is a card where there's a lot of very clear favourites. You know, if you look at the UFC, you get like, you get very mixed odds. Whereas if you look at this card, I, to get every, for every favourite to win, it was still only like eight or nine to one. You get better odds betting against Amanda Nunes in one fight than you would in getting every single fight on the Bellator card right. And then the day after 9-12, they're doing uh, one Archuleta versus Patchy, Patchy Mix. That could be fun, Patchy Mix. Uh, fought in Bellator, went over to Ryzen on behalf of Bellator, has picked up like three good first round submissions in a row, fun grappler, Juan Archuleta, uh, training partner of TJ Dillashaw, wrestles really well, just lost the decision to um, Patricio Pitbull. Feels like that's a big experience gap in like terms of quality of opposition. Plus, anytime you see a submission artist, bet on the wrestler anyway, because a lot of the time submissions just stop working at a certain level. Fuck, I said levels again. But you know what I mean? Once you meet grindy wrestlers or people who have trained with really good grindy wrestlers every day for however long, um, you're a lot harder to get guillotines on shots and um, a lot harder to get them to give up top position easily. John Fitch is fighting, fighting Maimon Gracie. Now that's a fun one because that is a submission artist against a wrestler where I do like the chances of the submission artist. However, John Fitch is still out here claiming he's going to get a knockout this time when he's finished one fight in 13 years. Um... Liz Carmouche is fighting Deanna Bennett, which is three fights down their second their second card of the weekend. This last went the distance with uh, Valentina Shevchenko, and Valentina Shevchenko didn't really do much in that fight. Uh, and then the UFC cut her because that's how legitimate that division is. Then you've got Derek Campos. Yeah, fuck all else to care about on that card. So there's lots to watch, even if... The, it's one of those ones where there's not a lot to hype up before the fights, but there's probably going to be a lot of interesting results after the fights for us to talk about. So I'm going to get back to writing the thing that I'm doing on Chris Eubank, the master of the sneaker, and that weird cup and saucer guard that he used um, for the Patreon boys. And if you want to read that, slash support the podcast, get in on the Patreon. If you want to send an email to the podcast, fightscomebypodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing anytime, fightprimer.com. I'm your boy Jack Slack. God, I hope Michelle Waterson doesn't score her first ever head kick knockout. Cheers.